morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, maybe during summer and some people on vacation, but some people are here. That's good. So let's stand and sing. Lord, build your kingdom here. Come set your rule.
had been arrested and he asked to speak to Caesar, the leader of the Roman Empire. Caesar was in Rome, so Paul got on a ship with other prisoners going there. Strong winds and rain tossed the ship. The ship's crew waited until the wind calmed to sail around the island of Crete, but the strong wind pushed the ship. The crew pulled the lifeboat on board so it would not float away. They tied ropes around the ship to hold it together in the storm. The next day, the crew threw things overboard. 
The wind and rain did not stop for many days. The men on the ship were afraid they would die. One night, God sent an angel to Paul. The angel told Paul to not be afraid. God would save the lives of everyone on the ship. Paul told everyone on board, Take courage, men. I believe God will do what he said. We will not die, but we will have to run the ship onto an island. As the ship drifted toward the island of Malta, some of the sailors tried to escape in their lifeboat. No, Paul told them, unless you stay on the ship, you won't be saved. The men listened to Paul and stayed. They cut the ropes of the lifeboat and let it float away. Paul told everyone to eat. He thanked God for the food. Then the crew raised the sails and headed toward the beach on the island. Suddenly, the ship struck a sandbar and stopped moving. Waves crashed into the ship and it began to break into pieces. An officer ordered everyone to swim to shore. Some swam and others clung to pieces of the ship. They all made it safely to shore. God saved all of their lives. The people on the island built a fire for them. As Paul gathered firewood, a viper bit his hand. The people thought he was a murderer and would die from the viper. When nothing happened, they decided Paul was a god. Paul healed a man and others came to be healed too. Three months later, Paul got on another ship and sailed to Rome. Paul was still a prisoner, but instead of going to jail, he was allowed to live in his own rented house. A soldier stayed with him to guard him. Paul lived in that house for two years and welcomed anyone who visited him. All day, he told his visitors about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them to believe in Jesus. It's always fun to learn about the Apostle Paul, and that's what our children are learning about. You know, it's a wonderful testimony of God's grace. Uh, Paul often reminds his readers uh, that he is the chiefest of all sinners, uh, that he does not deserve God's grace. He does not deserve God's forgiveness, yet God works through Paul, this imperfect man, uh, so that the word of Jesus Christ can go forth. A beautiful image, uh, not only of the Apostle Paul, but what God has called us, his church, to be today. So our children are going to be learning about the Apostle Paul. We also uh, have another opportunity for our children to learn and have some fun together coming up on Wednesday, July 13th. That will be our next Summer Night Lights. And our theme on July 13th is Escape Room. So our children of all ages are going to have an opportunity to participate in an escape room. Of course, we're going to teach them the Bible. Of course, we're going to give them a snack. Uh, so there will be a lot of fun stuff going on. Two things you can be thinking about as we lead up to July 13th. We know that it's a few weeks away, but we also know that there's a holiday week in the middle of that, uh, which we tend to forget about things for about a week, don't we? So we'd like you to pre-register your kids and their friends. A Facebook post went out at 9.35 this morning, uh, so you could even do it right now. Even if you pre-registered your children for the first SNL in June, we want you to pre-register again for the July 13th one. Also, we need some more help. Uh, we need some more help with the different aspects of the evening, uh, including helping with the escape rooms. So if you would be available that evening... Uh, please see Debbie Merrifield. She's sitting in the back. Or you can email her, um, office at glbc.org. That will get you in contact uh, so that we can plan and prepare for a wonderful, another wonderful evening of having fun with kids and, and teaching them about Christ. Another thing that I want to mention today is you probably noticed um, we changed where we are taking the offering. So it's been a couple of years now since COVID, since we've passed the offering plate. Um, and people have asked us if we're going to go back to doing that again. And frankly, we don't know. Uh, we don't, we're, no, we're not ready to do it right now. Uh, not knowing what the fall will bring, and it still feels kind of icky passing something that 100 people have touched to some people. And we get that. Uh, but we also realize that we've kind of hidden the offering boxes in the corners of these doors, and that may not be the most helpful thing either. 
Uh, so we put it right out in the center of the lobby. And look, you know that we are not big fans of coming up here and talking about giving or talking about money. Uh, so it's uncomfortable every time we do it, but we also realize how important it is. How important it is to support God's work um, and how much of a spiritual discipline it is to give of our resources and to give of our time. So that's why we wanted to highlight that a little bit more than we have in recent months. So that's why that is out there front and center. Hopefully it'll be a little bit easier and a reminder for everybody. Well, as we go to prayer, uh, I want to think about that first song that we sang uh, about God building his kingdom here and working through the church as his instrument to build his kingdom. Uh, that's an important message. It's an important message, especially over these last few days. A lot has happened in our country over the last few days, hasn't it? Um, with the decision about Roe v. Wade, and it's kind of increased the battle lines in many ways in this country. And we understand and are aware of what's going on. But here's the thing we have to remember as God's people. Legislation and court cases... Do not advance the kingdom of God. Legislation does not transform people's hearts. It does not bring them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, that's what we are about. That is the mission that God has given us. So, our mission has not changed even with the events of Friday. Our mission is still about loving and serving in the name of Jesus Christ. Our mission is still about proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's what saves lives. That's what transforms lives, not only now, but for all eternity. So we just want to say that loudly and clearly. Whatever um, is going on in our nation and all of the voices that are going to start yelling at it, we need to be about the business of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the church. Um, so join us on that, and we want to we wanna pray for those opportunities. And you know what? We want to dive in even further to love and to serve women, to love and to serve their families, to support ministries like Shared Pregnancy and the Lansing Rescue Mission. We love these ministries because they are about serving and about making Jesus Christ known. Um, so let's pray to that end. Our Father and our God, we do thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ that in the sending of your son, while we were yet sinners, Lord, that you sent your son to pay the penalty for our sin, that anyone and everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ will be forgiven, will be given new life, not only new life now, but new life forever. And our desire is to be men and women, boys and girls, who have embraced the good news of Jesus Christ and who proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So grant us opportunities as we leave this place to serve others in love, to meet needs, and to make Jesus Christ known. Put us in positions where we can have opportunity to tell people of the good news that we've experienced and the good news that they can experience salvation as well. Lord, that is our desire. Work through us. We know that it is you who builds your kingdom. We know that it is a work of your Holy Spirit, but we want to be instruments to that end. And to that end, we pray. And we pray this in the loving and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing. A mighty fortress is on.
the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You unravel me with a melody. Oh, you surround me with a song of deliverance. From my enemies till all my fears 
Well, Lilius Trotter was born in 1853. Uh, she was the daughter to Isabel and Alexander Trotter. Alexander was a wealthy stockbroker in London, and they lived in the west side of London. If you don't know, the west end of London was the wealthy part of town. And uh, Lilius had a gift. She was born with it. She could paint. And, um, and so uh, her paintbrush produced amazing uh, work. So amazing that, uh, I, for, I forgot to say, that her, died, her dad died when she was 12. But it really didn't affect the family too much because they were so, so wealthy to begin with. But um, on a trip to Florence, so that I had to say that because you always wonder, well, where, how can the family tr- travel to Florence in the 1850s? But anyways, I caught up with myself there. Anyway, see, on a trip to Florence, she was so good at her painting that her mother asked a London art critic to look at her work. His name was Ruskin, and uh, he looked at her work. So she's in her late teens. Now, let me me help you understand um, what this meant for her. It would be like if your 14-year-old son um, was a budding basketball player in Grand Ledge, and Tom Izzo just happened to be eating at the A&W. And you said to Tom, would you come and watch my boy play? He's quite talented. <laughs> He's heard that a million times, right? And it would be like if Tom Izzo, after watching your 14-year-old son say, this boy has talent, I would like to offer you um, for the next 20 years my coaching one-on-one, and I guarantee that you will play in the NBA. That's, this is how big of a deal it is for, for Lilius Totter, Trotter. She, she not only was offered by Ruskin to tutor her in the London art scene, he promised her, he said, if you go with me, you will be the greatest artist that England has ever seen. That's a pretty big offer, right? She said no. She thought about it long and hard. And she said, no. Here's what she writes about that moment. She said, she said she could not give herself to painting and continue still to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then she wrote, writes that that decision gave her a grand independence of soul, which she later described as the liberty of those who have nothing to lose because they have nothing to keep. And so she was free. And so she, she did what all wealthy West End Londoners did. She began to volunteer at the local YWCA. She worked in the evenings, going to Victoria Station, um, encouraging prostitutes to leave that life, and uh, she helped them find noble work. She started the first women's restaurant in all of London for women by women. At that time, women were relegated to eat their lunches on the street, uh, and so she made it more noble. Um, She eventually sensed the call to go to Algeria, so she applied to go to Africa with the missions board, and they said no. You've had too many health problems. And so she continued her work in London. When she was 35, she decided to go on her own. And so she got a friend, and they went to Algeria, to Algiers, and started mission work there. For many years, it was hard work. There were political tensions between France and Britain, and it restricted her work. She was working with Muslim women and children. But her work was eventually successful. After four decades, there were 13 mission stations across the northern part of Africa. And they wrote of her on many occasions that she was ahead of her time, that she had cutting-edge ministry, uh, unlike what was going on in the world all around her. 
She writes later on in life about her sacrifice. She said that every time she picked up her paintbrush, she felt a deep sense of loss. Every time she would paint in her journal, she felt like I lost something in life. And so, so I asked this morning, what would cause Lilius Crotter to turn from so much and move into missions work, to, to move towards working with women in London? What would, what would move her to do that? And so that's my question for you this morning is, is what would move you to move toward what God has for you to serve in his kingdom? What would engage you to sacrifice and to give of yourself in the kingdom of God, in his church, in our community, to turn from certain things and engage that way and to make a sacrifice? That's the question I want to answer for us this morning, and we'll be looking at the book of Ephesians. I'm hoping that I want to put you in a room with Lilius Trotter, the book of Ephesians, and the Holy Spirit, and just let you think about how God would use you in the world. How would he use you right here in Grand Ledge? How would he use you in our church to do good works? And so, the book of Ephesians. Turn there, if you would. Ephesians is a very dense book. Very thick with theology, the first half. Um, You can read it in about 30 minutes, but it'll take years to really understand, uh, to plumb the depths of it. Um, The book is really split up in two parts. The first part is is Paul's robust theology. It's it's very um, churchy in its language. It uses big words. It's, It's very heavy. That's the first half. Paul talks about the church and his calling to reach the Gentiles and and how the Jews and the Gentiles come together to make this new humanity and that God is at work in the world. He's rescuing us. And that's really the first half of the book. The second half of the book is very practical, if that's an easy way to say it. Uh, It it talks about marriage and family and relationships. It talks about how we relate to each other in the church as as brothers and sisters in unity and really how God is equipping the church through leaders to to advance the kingdom of God. And so the book is cut into two parts, theological, heavy, dense, and then the second part, practical, helpful, helpful. Uh, uh, really engaged towards helping us be people who live holy lives. So with all that in mind, let's turn to chapter 1. And here's what I want you to see. I won't give away the punchline just yet. But here's what I want you to see as we look at chapters 1 and 2, is that God has rescued you for a purpose. And if you're taking notes, just write that down. This is what the first part of Ephesians is all about. God has rescued you. You for a purpose. Now, starting in verse 3 of chapter 1, we have this very dense, very heavy description of God's work on the earth and that he, that he has a rescue plan. And so we could spend three or four Sundays in these verses, but I'm just going to read them to you once and fast, all right? So I'm really going to help you out with that, but I, I'm going somewhere, so trust me. So just look at these words that Paul writes about about who we are and what God has done. Ephesians 1, 3. And praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms 
with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. <laughs> like you read that and you say, oh, Paul, stop. Like, like, oh, you're saying too much. Oh, this is too sweet. This is too glorious. Um, but he clearly helps us see that God has intervened on our behalf, that, that he entered into the world through Jesus Christ to bring us hope and redemption and reconciliation. That's, that's really the summary of those few verses. He restates this idea in chapter 2, but in, in a different way. He, he restates those ideas in chapter 2 in words that you probably have read or maybe even memorized on many occasions, that, that, um, that, that God has given us grace. So we'll look at chapter 2. He does it a little differently, though, in chapter 2. He helps us see how bad we were uh, and then helps us see how good God is. In chapter 1, he just laid out this beautiful plan, this movement of God, our direction that he lavished on us. In chapter 2, he says, you were dead and Christ made you alive. Look at it with me, chapter 2. Familiar words, I'm sure. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, When you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, But because of his great love for us, but because of his great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that the, in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And in case you missed it, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast. And so, so I, what I want you to see is, is in chapters 1 and chapter 2 is that God has rescued us. He moved our direction through Jesus Christ. He lavished his love upon us. Grace has come to us. That's fairly clear in those first two chapters. Now, I I want you to keep going with me, and this is where we're landing this morning in in verse 10. This is what we're going to think about in verse 10, and this this is where I hope Lilius Trotter's story and the book of Ephesians, and specifically First 10, and the Holy Spirit bring you to a place where you begin to think about how you will step into what God has for you in good works in our church, in our community, and maybe in the world of missions. Look at it, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork. Those five words... I think, are a summary of chapter 1 and what we've read in chapter 2. All this dense theological ideas, God's love and grace and beauty poured into us through Jesus Christ. I think those five words capture perfectly what God is doing in the world and what he's doing in your life. Just let those words settle into your heart. For we are God's 
handiwork. Another way you could translate that is you are God's masterpiece. That, that the canvas of your life came into God's care. And he painted your life with the brushstrokes of grace. The brushstrokes of redemption. And all other aspects of the canvas of your life, all those other colors of who you are and how you were raised and what you've been through come to complement the beautiful color of grace. You, brothers and sisters, are God's handiwork. You are his masterpiece. I don't know what the color of God's grace is. And I, when I imagined it in my mind, I think it's the colors of a sunrise, maybe. The beauty of, of those colors or the color of grace in our life. Listen, I'll say it again. Brothers and sisters, you are God's handiwork. You are are his masterpiece. Look at the next line. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. Lest there's any doubt, the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, God sent his son. This is all of this this rich theology that we've already read, that, that we just kind of flew over, that it all comes to us. This idea of, his, of us being his handiwork, of us, of us being his masterpiece, comes to us in Christ Jesus. Keep reading. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good things works, to do good works. I want to keep a very broad definition on this idea of good works. It could be like Lilius Trotter, who, who has this deep calling in her life, and, and she was willing to sacrifice and go to Algiers. So that's one idea. It could be a calling on your life where God has given you this heart for junior hires or fifth and sixth graders and you decide that your tenure at Grand Ledge Baptist Church go figure will be to hang out with junior hires right Junior hires, you're a lot of work. We love you, right? Can I get an amen? Yeah, right. Listen, um, you may have a sense of calling in your life that you want to invest in young married couples and that you want to start a small group. And you want to pour into them for years Years and years for the glory of Christ. And so uh, this idea of missions work is one calling. Uh, working in our local church, investing and doing good works in that calling. And then I think it's kind of everyday, everyday moments, everyday opportunities where, where we see that, that God has called us to these good works, that, that we just step into them. So I was on my motorcycle this last week, ran down to Missouri and hung out with my father-in-law and my brother and did, did, what, did what you do. You know, we rode, curvy roads. That was, that was wonderful. And then I headed to, to Denver after that and because we had our national conference there, our Converge National Conference, and of course I, I was there for my work and for our church. But on the way... On uh, Sunday afternoon, I was starting to get a little ripe, and so I had to do some laundry. And I went into this, this in Hayes, Kansas, in this little laundry mat that I found on Google. 
and I did my laundry. Jill was thankful. But while I was in there, what do you do when you're in the laundromat? Like, I haven't been in the laundromat in 20 years, 30, 30 years. So there I was watching the wash machine lights. And uh, there was this young couple sitting and watching their laundry spin in the dryer. And I tell you what, God gave me, like, the sweetest moment. I just started asking him, who are you? What do you do? What's your life all about? Like, I don't know, I feel maybe I'm old enough I can ask those questions of strangers. But anyways, they were getting married, and they were talking about this, and he had just bought a boat, and she was a nurse aide, and he was working for FedEx, and they were getting married. He said, are you going to have a big wedding? No, we're going to keep it simple. And I just started to do premarital counseling with him. <laughs> you know, again, the old guy giving advice, right? And we have all these, these wonderful moments. But we can step in. Because of what Christ has done for us. Because he has rescued us. Because we are his masterpiece. We move into these places where we do good work. And that's such a broad thing. And it's, it's almost undefinable. It's so broad. Look at the last line. Verse 10 again. For we are God's handiwork, his masterpiece. In Christ, in Christ Jesus, to do good works. Look at this last line. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hmm. Hmm. So, what does that mean? So are you saying to me that God has mapped out my life, every little turn and every little moment, and he has good works that, that I'm doing? I don't think that's the idea there. We're not robots, right? I'll do my best robot dance for you. That's it. We're not robots, right? So what does it mean there? And here's the, here's the thought that came to my mind. When you go to a restaurant, you have a menu, right? Do you guys eat out? Yeah, I know you do. And on this menu are all your options. Vegetarian stuff, meat, dessert, right? And, and this is how I think this works. God, because he has rescued us, because we are his masterpiece, because he's called us, that, that he, he puts a menu of opportunities in front of us to do good works that he has prepared in advance. And we can miss, I think we can miss those opportunities for various reasons. I, I think I think we can be too busy or too, too fearful or just selfish, right? And, and I, I really believe that, that, that when we look at this menu, we have this broad category, the kingdom of God, the church. And then there's this list of things that you can be involved in that are specific to you. Because he has created you just the way you are. You are his masterpiece. He's brought you through different things. He has put you in your church. You aren't Lilius Trotter in the West End of London who is called to work with prostitutes and then go to Africa. You're not her. You are you. And so God, in his beauty, and grace rescued you and has given you this menu. And, and my question to you is what is going to move you towards those good works that he has prepared in advance for you? 
So maybe you're, you're not into my sermon too much. You're like, too busy? I got too much going on? I've done that already? I've done my good works? I'm too old? Uh, frankly, I just don't care? Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not down with you, Andrew. I, I can't step into those things. And so I asked earlier, what, what caused Lilius Trotter to move towards that sacrifice? And you know why she stepped towards it? Well, it's in chapter 1 in Paul's prayer. Look at it. Look at chapter 1. Paul has two prayers in, in his letter. It, listen, if you want to learn how to pray, you pray these prayers for yourself and your family and your friends and, and ask God to change your life. He will. And so if you're feeling like, hey, I'm not down with this. I'm, I can't do it. No, I've drawn the line. Other people can handle it. Here's, here's, here's the prayer that you need to pray. And you need to pray it every day until God changes your heart and moves you into what he wants you to do. He's prepared. Look at it. For this reason, verse 15, I should tell you that. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking, look at this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Listen, chapter 1 and chapter 2 paint this amazing picture of who God is and what he has done. You spend time in that, and you pray this prayer you will know God, and that is the heart that will move us to serving. So Lilius Trotter was involved in the Deeper Life Conferences of the late 1800s. Uh, a revival swept across England, and these Deeper Life Conferences were events that were held where her and her mom in her early 20s would go and sit and grow in the word. She was part of the Anglican church at that time. I don't know if, if those movements were a response to maybe some Anglican issues in the church, or maybe it, was a, maybe it was God's move overall in England to move people closer to him. But for Lilius Trotter, that was what moved her heart closer to God and this deep commitment to step into the things that God had prepared for her to do. And so if you're saying, oh, no, nah, mm, I'm not down with this. I just want to challenge you to pray the prayer. Pray the prayer every day and ask to know God better, that your eyes would be opened, that, that you would experience the revelation of his word, and that you would know him. second thing I want to offer to you is pastoral coaching, right? So you don't know, wh where should I dive in? How should I serve? Am I washed up? Am I too young? What can I do around this place? How can I invest? Your pastors would love to just sit with you and ask you a bunch of questions, just, just to talk with you. And then maybe show you the menu. I'd love to help you with that. Pastor John and, and Brian would love to help you with that. All right, so on average, we get about 4,000 weeks in our life. Do the math. Go ahead. Do the math. I'm watching you guys. Get about 4,000. The first 1,000 you know, you're in diapers, you're, you're figuring out life, you're just trying to walk, you're, you're getting through high school, and maybe a little college, you're trying to find a spouse, you know, you're busy. I'll say that 
um, there's a place for you to serve if you're out of diapers at Grand Ledge Baptist Church. If you're a teenager, if you're a junior higher, if you're younger, there's a place for you to serve. All right, so let me say that. So that so the last, you know, thousand, depending on how old you go, you know, the old body's starting to wear out a little. You're tired easily. In the middle, the middle 2,000, what are you doing? You're raising kids. You're trying to figure out marriage maybe or singleness. You're, you're trying to have a career. Listen, we get about 4,000 years, and, and through every season, there's a reason. Yes, weeks. You knew exactly what I said, <laughs> and you embarrassed me on the live stream. You get 4,000 years. There's an ex- <laughs> I'm, I'm sticking with it. You get 4,000 weeks. Every season of those 4,000 weeks is busy and unique. You just step into what God has for you. how amazing he is and that he's called you and step into it. Father, we'll we'll sing about Jesus here in a moment. We're so thankful that it is through his good work in our lives, the grace of Christ and, and the power that comes through him is the source of our strength. And so we rely on Christ. Give us eyes to see you better, to know how amazing you are. Help us be people who step into what you have for us, right? to be kingdom people, to advance the church and the gospel, to change lives, to change um, each other and our community, and maybe... Togo, or whatever you have for us. Maybe it's being a pastor. Whatever you have for us, we'll follow your lead. Help us see it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. King of my heart, be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, and you are God. 
God's goodness, he has wrote on the canvas of your life, there are people all around you who he's painting grace in their life. So we are dispensaries of grace. God flows through us in these good works to touch people who need him. So go in his grace and be people who step into those good opportunities to bless and help others know him too. God be with you.